Hello, my name is Dr. Michal Scanlon, and in this keynote, I will present our recent work involving electrosynthesis of 2D conducting polymer films at an electrified liquid-liquid interface. Now, I'll begin my talk by giving a brief outline. First, I will give a brief background to electrochemistry at the interface between two miscible electrolyte solutions, or DETs. I will discuss the work we have primarily carried out involving poly 34 ethylene dioxytiophene, or PDAT and I will outline current methods to synthesize this conducting polymer and its applications. I will give a comprehensive outline of the mechanism of interfacial electrosynthesis of 2D PDOT films, and in turn, I will discuss both the thermodynamics and the kinetics of 2D PDOT film formation. I will outline our work to characterize the PDOT material um, film ex situ using microscopic, spectroscopic, and electrochemical methodologies, and finally, I will outline some very exciting preliminary biocompatibility studies we've carried out with our 2D PDOT films. So certain liquid-liquid interfaces form between the interface between two miscible electrolyte solutions, such as those of water and trifluorotoluene, are electrophiable. And this special four-electrode electrochemical cell is used to study electrochemical processes occurring at these liquid-liquid interfaces with the interface here effectively acting as the working electrode. Now, importantly, all electrochemical techniques used with solid electrodes, such as cyclic voltammetry, can also be applied at the 80s. However, the meaning of the CVs is different. For example, the width of the polarized well potential window at the 80s is typically limited by ion transfer of either the aqueous or the organic electrolyte and anion cation at the positive and negative potentials. The electrolyte we use in the organic phase is this perihydrophobic salt known as BATB, and this allows us to get as large a potential window as possible in terms of the transfer of the organic electrolyte cation and anion from one phase to the other. Now, for more in-depth um, information on this technique, I recommend these recent reviews and book chapters uh, for a good place to start. Now, unlike at solid electrode electrolyte interfaces, where electron transfer is primarily studied, at ETs, you have several different types of charge transfer that may take place, either individually or simultaneously. For example, simple or facilitated ion transfer, electron transfer between redox couple, couples in opposite phases, or light-induced electron transfer between redox couples in opposite phases, or indeed absorption, can all give rise to electrochemical signals at the liquid-liquid interface. Now, in this work, I will discuss electro interfacial electron transfer between redox couples in opposite phases, one being an aqueous oxidant and the other being an organic monomer, leading to electrosynthesis of a 2D conducting polymer film at the liquid-liquid interface. So what are conducting polymers? So conducting polymers are lightweight, flexible, and transparent materials, making them ideal for incorporation into various technologies as 2D tin films such as in supercapacitors, organic electrochemical transistors, and organic solar cells. Now, PDOT is one of the most commercially exploited polymers due to its high conductivity, ambient stability, and biocompatibility. However, due to its hydrophobic nature, PDOT is rarely produced in a pure form. Instead, a complex of PDOT and a hydrophilic an anionic surfactant additive, known as polystyrene sulfonate, is essential to aid its processability, so to make it more aqueous soluble. However, an excess of this PSS has detrimental effects on PDOT film conductivity, long-term stability, specific capacity, and biocompatibility. So if the addition of PSS can be avoided to make tin films, that would be a major advantage. Now, how are conducting polymer films currently made? So current methodologies to generate conducting polymer tin films have deficiencies that hinder progress. So chemical polymerization is a multi-step process, requiring the synthesis and the isolation of nanomaterials, their mixing with additives or binders, and then compressing them or coating them into films by spray or spin coating and inkjet or screen print printing of solutions. Now this leads to low material utilization and increases the risk of detachment of additives during long-term usage, which jeopardizes the lifespan of these tin films. Then you have single step methodologies such as electropolymerization. However, these take place on solid electrodes and have features that hamper tin film scale up and complicate device integration. So in particular, the tin films are irreversibly adhered to the electrode surface. 
And meanwhile, you also have vapor phase techniques. So these can be complicated or expensive to implement because they require vacuum chambers and also they may be incompatible with heat sensitive substrates. So therefore, the main objective of the work I'll outline here is to achieve interfacial electrosynthesis without conductive solid electrodes. And this will lead to a technology platform capable of producing freestanding, additive-free, reproducible, easily transferable, scalable 2D films in a single step at ambient conditions. So a huge host of benefits uh, listed here. Now, a liquid-liquid interface provides a reproducible and a defect-free environment to prepare and process freestanding 2D films of nanomaterials, such as conducting polymers in a single step. However, most studies involve spontaneous interfacial reactions, such as polycondensation, polyaddition, or self-assembly, and this undermines the field's ability because it only permits rudimentary chemical control over reaction kinetics and a limited ability to study the synthetic mechanism in situ. But both of these issues are solved by electrifying the liquid-liquid interface or polarizing deities. So during interfacial electrosynthesis, an externally applied potential difference is uh, <clears throat> applied by potentiostat, and is known as the interfacial galvanic potential difference, and it provides exquisite electrochemical control over the kinetics of interfacial electron transfer between an aqueous oxidant, in this case, and an organic polymer, leading to the formation of an interfacial tin film, as we see here. So also, this approach has the inbuilt advantage that you can probe the mechanism of electrosynthesis electrochemically. Now, previous work has been carried out in this field by the groups of Canan, Marashek, and Dreyf, and these all provided some nice early insights into electropolymerization or electrosynthesis at electrified aqueous organic interfaces. So a key aspect of interfacial electrosynthesis is that it will produce 2D films with distinctive molecular architectures and physiochemical properties that will be inaccessible in bulk solution or at solid electrode interfaces. So we have broken down the mechanism of P dot tin film interfacial electrosynthesis into five distinct stages with time, which I'll now present in the next five slides to give a comprehensive overview of this technique. So to begin with is interfacial electron transfer, and this occurs between the aqueous um, cerium 4 plus oxidant and E dot organic monomer, um, forming red monomeric radical cations in the diffusion layer on the organic side of the ETs. So you have interfacial electron transfer forming these radical cations. Now, for interfacial electron transfer to proceed with appreciable kinetics, DTs must be polarized positively, as I will discuss later, with the potential set to a value near the positive extreme of the galvani polarizable potential window. The radical cations formed are stabilized by weakly coordinating organic anion, so that's Tb minus that I discussed, and these will further couple with each other, leading to the formation of dimers in the diffusion layer. Now, continuous radical cation generation by interfacial electron transfer and ensuing radical coupling steps ultimately lead to the formation of cationic P dot oligomers. And um, also, these coupling steps result in the release of protons. And these protons will build up on the organic side of deities, um, and they are stabilized by the P dot tin film itself or by water present inside the film. Now, in the second step, we have interfacial adsorption. And this interfacial adsorption involves ion pairing between the cationic P dot oligomer and aqueous electrolyte anions, and in our case, they are sulfate anions, that takes place once these oligomers here reach a certain critical size after an induction period. The aqueous sulfate anions displace the weakly coordinating organic Tb minus anions during interfacial adsorption, um, with the result being that the aqueous anions are dissolved opened in the P dot tin film. Now, this deposition process is typically driven by the energetically favorable reduction of the interfacial tension between the two uh, liquid phases, the oil and the water, upon monomer absorption. So the maximum value of the interfacial tension occurs near the potential of zero charge at the 80s. And this dictates the critical size of the P dot oligomers needed to become surface active at the 80s. So in other words, as the interfacial tension increases, the oligomers that absorb their critical size decreases. 
So if we set the potential slightly negative of the potential of zero charge, this is optimal for oligomer adsorption, ensuring that the presence of a sufficient concentration of sulfate here is present at the liquid-liquid interface for ion pairing. And it also allows us to simultaneously maintain a large interfacial tension. Thus, for optimal interfacial electrosynthesis, the interfacial electron transfer and the oligomer interfacial adsorption steps, so steps one and two, must take place at different applied potentials. And this means that potentiodynamic electrochemical techniques, such as cyclic voltammetry, will be favored over potentiostatic electrochemical techniques. So in the third step, we have nucleation and growth of absorbed p-dot oligomers taking place at the liquid-liquid interface. So the p-dot oligomers here are like conducting islands that float at the interface, and they act as bipolar electrodes. So in effect, they provide an abundance of catalytic sites that act as electrical shortcuts to catalyze interfacial electron transfer between the cerium aqueous oxidant and the e-dot species in the organic phase. So this is an autocatalytic effect, and interfacial electron transfer therefore proceeds at a much lower over potential than at a bare ITIs with a several order of magnitude higher kinetic rate constant expected. Thus, these p-dot islands will show rapid 2D growth parallel to the liquid-liquid interface. Now, in the fourth step, gaps between the individual rapidly growing islands of p-dot will disappear, and a highly compact 2D p-dot film coalesces at the 80s that is flat on both sides with a thickness of around 50 nanometers. In the fifth and final step of the mechanism, continued a physical barrier now exists between the cerium and the EDOT species either side of the However, due to its conductive nature, interfacial electron transfer continues through the p dot tin film, though at a reduced rate to the autocatalyzed scenario that I discussed in step three. So interfacial electron transfer now will be subject to the influence of the diffusion here of the sulfate counteranions through the film to maintain electron neutrality locally within that film. And continued interfacial electron transfer will initiate here a secondary 3D growth process into the organic phase as the thickness of the p-dot film increases. And this controllable secondary growth process leads to the formation of a highly porous 3D structure that can have a thickness up to 850 nanometers in the tin film at the liquid-liquid interface. Okay, so in the next few slides, I will now look at each of the five steps of interfacial electrosynthesis, and I'll ask some key questions. So to begin with, in step one, the key question is, is interfacial electron transfer between the aqueous cerium oxidant and the E-dot organic monomer thermodynamically possible within the polarizable potential window at 80s. So the potential window at an aqueous trifluorotoluene interface studied here extends from minus 0.4 volts up to plus 0.6 volts. And to answer this question, what we need to do is we need to determine the standard potential for uh, galvanic potential for interfacial electron transfer. And this represents the galvanic potential where the interfacial redox reaction is at equilibrium. Now, this equilibrium potential is assumed to be the half-wave potential of the reversible redox process and may be determined from the standard redox potentials of the aqueous and the, of the aqueous here and the organic redox species in either phase. So this uh, so the aqueous redox couple in our case is a cerium oxidant, and the organic redox couple is the E dot monomer and its radical cation. So this is the equation we need to work with. Okay, so now we need to get these values. And to do that, what we do is we, first of all, um, using a polycrystalline gold electrode in a three electrode configuration, we determined the redox potential of the aqueous cerium oxidant to be plus 1.43 volts versus standard hydrogen electrode. And that's in agreement with literature values. Meanwhile, the onset potential here of E dot oxidation in, um, was determined in organic TFT. Uh, using a polycrystalline platinum electrode. So this hasn't been reported before, and we got a value of plus 1.435 volts for the onset potential of E dot um, oxidation in trifluorotoluene. So therefore, if we put these values into this um, equation, we get a value of more or less zero for the standard galvanic uh, potential for interfacial electron transfer. 
So the conclusion here is that interfacial electron transfer between the cerium oxidant and E dot monomer can only proceed with appreciable kinetics by applying a driving force, as the standard potential is zero volts, but it should occur within the potential window available at the liquid-liquid interface. So we also did experiments then with what's known as a closed bipolar electrochemical cell in a four electrode configuration. And we use this to directly determine the standard galvanic potential for interfacial electron transfer for biphasic P dot electrosynthesis on the galvanic scale. So as discussed in our recent articles here, in this bipolar setup, interfacial electron transfer between the redox couples is thermodynamically equivalent to the same corresponding event occurring at the itties. Now, the bipolar electrode consisted of two individual gold disc electrodes, one in each phase uh, or each compartment, acting as the aqueous and the organic pole. And these were connected by an electric wire. So each compartment contained a platinum wire driving electrode here, and also reference electrodes. As the galvanic potential difference between the aqueous and the organic phase is biased positively by the potential snatch, this facilitated electron transfer at the organic pole uh, to aqueous cerium, which is reduced at the aqueous pole. So you have p-dot film formation here as the e-dot is oxidized and the electron moves along the electrical wire where it's picked up by the cerium species. So this is what we get in terms of cyclic voltammetry. So using the closed bipolar electrochemical cell, we determined here that the standard galvanic potential for inter interfacial electron transfer for biphasic p-dot electrosynthesis was indeed approximately zero volts. <clears throat> so compared with the closed bipolar electrochemical experiments, additional overpotentials to interfacial electron transfer are expected at the 80s, such as reorganization energies and double layer effects. So as a result, this will push the galvanic potential for electron transfer a little bit more positive uh, than would be thermodynamically perfect. So at the liquid-liquid interface, we at least expect over potentials of around 200 millivolts, and therefore interfacial electron transfer is not expected to occur spontaneously. <clears throat> and indeed, to show this, if you take an aqueous solution of 2 millimolar of cerium 4 plus in 0.2 molar sulfuric acid and contact it with an organic phase of E dot and trifluorotoluene. So basically this cell here, no P dot tin film forms after 24 hours. Therefore to initiate 2D P dot film formation for this aqueous oxidant organic monomer combination, the liquid liquid interface must be polarized using a potential set in conjunction with a four electrode electrochemical cell. And that's what we did. Okay, so here in this uh, slide, we have the evolution of E dot or P dot polymerization at the electrified liquid liquid interface, and we have 50 CV cycles. Now, to our knowledge, this is the first example of CVs representative of interfacial electrosynthesis of conducting polymers being recorded at an electrified liquid liquid interface. The double layer grows steadily with cycling, and this is in a manner that is similar to electropolymerization at a solid electrode, although the meaning of the various peaks here is different. So interfacial electron transfer between the cerium and the EDOT forming ligamers was predicted based on the thermodynamics to occur at positive potentials of plus 0.2 volts. And indeed here at plus 0.2 volts, we see we have a wave of interfacial electron transfer. So this here is our interfacial electron transfer peak. And these peak, this peak here is due to adsorption of oligomers at the liquid-liquid interface. So you can see we begin here with a yellow aqueous cerium solution and a colorless uh, EDOT solution with the monomers. And the cerium is um, reduced and it goes colorless and you get the P dot tin film formed at the interface due to these CV cycling. Um, and this is the first ever example of this at a liquid-liquid interface. So then we did some in situ parallel beam UVVs absorbance measurements to qualitatively monitor, monitor first the reduction of cerium 4 plus to cerium 3 plus just above the liquid liquid interface during, electro, uh, <clears throat> during interfacial electrosynthesis. And here we see that cerium 4 plus is indeed depleted with time with the absorbance at 385 nanometers decreasing. 
We then did additional UV phase absorbance measurements with the parallel beam shining through the P-dot tin film that was formed and um, at the ITIS. And we get this spectrum. So this spectrum was that of a P-doped P-dot tin film with a polaronic band observed at around 700 nanometers. And this signifies that the P-dot tin film is in an oxidized state. Okay, so a key question now for step two of the mechanism is, can we provide electrochemical evidence that interfacial absorption involves ion pairing between the cationic p-dot oligomers and aqueous sulfate anions, as shown here? So to answer this question, we compared differential capacitance measurements of the blank, so here in red, with CV cycles two to six in the presence of aqueous cerium and organic EDOT. So by CV cycle two, the potential of zero charge has shifted negatively from around zero volts to 0 0.055 volts. And the differential capacitance curves have flattened significantly compared to that of the blank. So to be clear, each of these um, AC voltammograms were obtained after each of these CVs. Now the potential of zero charge is sensitive to the interfacial absorption of species either from the aqueous or the organic phase. And this negative shifting implies adsorption of positive species. Thus, the negative shift in the PZC by CV cycle 2 is attributed to interfacial absorption of cationic p dot oligomers, and the flattening of the curves indicates a decrease in permittivity at the aqueous trifluorotoluene interface due to the presence of these adsorbed oligomers. Now, with additional CV cycles, we see that a sharp peak here appears around minus 0 0.01 volts, and this is attributed to interfacial ion pairing between the p-dot oligomers and aqueous sulfate anions. And the peak's magnitude increases with cycling as the p-dot oligomer concentration increases in the diffusion zone on the organic side of DTs. So furthermore, the differential capacitance increases across the width of the polarizable potential window with this cycling due to the accumulation of more charge as the p-dot tin film grows. Now, interfacial electron transfer and oligomer interfacial adsorption steps occur at different potentials. So our conclusion is that double potential step chronoperometry, so DPSCA, was chosen as the electrochemical methodology for, to provide the external driving force for the remainder of our experiments. So here we have the results. A single DPSCA cycle involves first holding the galvanic potential at plus 0.4 volts for 10 seconds to induce interfacial electron transfer between the cerium and the EDOT with appreciable kinetics, leading to a positive current time transient and the formation of cationic P-dot oligomers in the diffusion zone on the organic side of the 80s. Next, the galvanic potential was said held at minus 0.1 volts for a further 10 seconds to induce p dot oligomer interfacial absorption, leading to a negative current time transient. So the value of minus 0.1 was chosen, and it is highly negative of the PZC at a bare liquid-liquid interface or aqueous TFT interface, and, and we determined that earlier by AC voltammetry. So thus, a potential of minus 0.1 volts is predicted uh, to provide the ideal interfacial conditions to ensure a sufficient concentration of sulfate to participate in ion pairing with the positively charged p-dot oligomers, and also a large enough interfacial tension to aid oligomer adsorption, while also preventing an accumulation of protons on the organic side of the 80s that would otherwise electrostatically inhibit interfacial electron transfer from E-dot to cerium. Now, moving on to discussing the kinetics of interfacial electrosynthesis, for step three of the mechanism, the key question is, can the autocatalysis of interfacial electron transfer between the cerium and the EDOT species by P-DOT oligomers acting as floating conductive islands be monitored electrochemically? Now, the charge recorded from both the positive interfacial electron transfer and negative um, interfacial oligomer absorption current transients here during the first 18 cycles um, displayed identical trends and provide key evidence of the autocatalytic effect. So the charge here increases slowly during the first five cycles, representing an initial induction period during which interfacial electron transfer between the cerium and the EDOT is taking place at a bare liquid-liquid interface. And that's prior to the p-dot oligomers reaching the critical size they needed to adsorb. Now, once the p-dot oligomers adsorb at around cycle five or six, interfacial electron transfer 
proceeds autocatalytically, leading to the peanut islands showing rapid 2D growth parallel to liquid liquid interface during cycles six to nine. So this is seen by the extremely rapid increase in the recorded charge during these uh, DPSCA cycles and is evidence of the autocatalytic effect. Now, if we return to the mechanism, so for step four, the key question is, does interfacial electron transfer continue once the gaps between individual rapidly growing islands of P dot disappear and a highly compact 2D P dot film coalesces at the liquid liquid interface? Now, again, we can address this by analyzing the charge recorded from both the positive interfacial electron transfer and negative interfacial adsorption current transients during the first 18 cycles. Now, by cycle 9 or 10, highly compact 2D P dot film has coalesced at the liquid liquid interface and it is acting as a physical barrier. But nevertheless, in interfacial electron transfer continues through the conductive film as the charge continues to increase as um, though at a greatly reduced rate uh, from the autocatalyzed scenario. So for all uh, cycles greater than nine, the thickness of the P-dot film does continue to increase uh, due to its conductive nature, allowing interfacial electron transfer to take place. And so scanning electrochemical or SEM images of the 2D P-dot tin films were carried out after 150 DPSCA cycles, and they revealed an incredible asymmetric morphology. So we call it a Janus morphology. So one side is flat at the nanoscale, while the other side shows a rough porous 3D structure. So the flat side is the aqueous facing side and mirrors the defect free nature of the liquid liquid interface. The rough side is the organic facing side and resembles the morphology of PDOT and many other conducting polymers typically observed after electropolymerization using solid electrodes. So these SEM images show that in effect, the liquid liquid interface acts as an anchoring point and upon electron transfer during CV cycling, the PDOT tin film nucleates and grows down into the organic phase. So also the asymmetric nature of the PDOT tin film leads to each side having its own distinct physical properties. So for example, using sessile drop measurements, then we can highlight significant differences of hydrophobicity on either side of the PDOT tin film with a water droplet contact angle of 89.5 degrees in the water side and 112.2 in the rough organic facing side. So here are some more SEM images highlighting the vast difference in morphology between the aqueous and the organic side. So the organic side is very rough and the aqueous side is essentially featureless and flat at the nanoscale. So for step five of the mechanism, an interesting question then is, can the transition from a 2D P dot film to a 3D film be controlled electrochemically now that we've explored the genus morphology? So the evolution of the morphology of the organic facing side of the tin film can be controlled with DPSCA cycling as depicted schematically here. So the thickness of each stage can then be measured with AFM. So initially after 50 cycles, we have a thickness of around 50 nanometers and the tin film is shown grows 2D parallel to the liquid liquid interface. It's a highly compact structure on both sides. Now we continued um, cycling our interfacial electrosynthesis, we get this secondary 3D growth, which begins to extend into the organic phase as the thickness of the P dot film increases. And this controllable secondary growth process leads to the formation of a very porous 3D structure with a thickness of up to 850 nanometers after prolonged interfacial synthesis as shown here. So, TEM images or transmission electron microscopy revealed that the P dot tin film is extremely stable under the TEM beam, so that's 80 kilovolts, signaling a high thermal conductivity and providing an opportunity to further investigate the 2D P dot film's nanostructure. So both bright field and then dark field TM images show that the flat aqueous side consists of a compact layer of P dot nanofibers that run parallel to the liquid liquid interface. The diameter of the P-dot nanofibers varied from 5 nanometers to around 50 nanometers. And we propose that the nanofibers with the very small diameter less than 5 nanometers are first to be deposited at DTs during interfacial synthesis, forming an initial compact layer. And then subsequently, the nanofiber diameter increases as the tin film grows down into the organic phase. So we then carried out 
X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So XPS was used to probe the chemical composition of, and doping level of the P.10 film. So the XPS uh, survey spectrum here shows the presence of only sulfur, carbon, and oxygen within the five nanometer sampling depth. And this indicates that the cerium oxidant was not incorporated into the tin film during interfacial electrosynthesis. So oxidant contamination is a common drawback associated with traditional chemical polymerization methods, and it must be therefore addressed with post-processing purification. Now, the absence of boron and fluorine implies that the organic electrolyte TB minus anion is not involved in the P doping of the tin film. Therefore, the aqueous sulfate anion is considered the primary dopant. And analysis of both sides of the tin film here, so this is the organic facing site analysis and the aqueous facing site analysis, gave the exact same chemical composition. Now, the doping level of the P dot tin film was estimated by analysis of the high resolution sulfur 2P spectrum. The sulfur atom present in each E dot can be distinguished from the sulfur atom present in the uh, sulfate anion by the differences in the binding energy. So the signal for sulfur present in the SO4 2 minus anion is centered at the higher binding energy of 169.1 electron volts due to the presence of four electronegative oxygen atoms which withdraw electron density from the sulfur atom. In comparison, the sulfur atom in the typhene ring of E dot occurs at 165.5 electron volts. Therefore, a comparison of peak areas attributed to each sulfur species allowed a direct estimation of the doping levels as around 35%. So we have one sulfate anion for every three E dot units in the film. That's within the five nanometer sampling depth that we looked at. And this actually corresponds to the maximum theoretical dopant to mono ratio possible for P dot. Now, a material's electrical conductivity is related to its uh, performance in an electronic device. Therefore, we carried out ex situ or in plane or dry conductivity measurements of the 2D tin film by, inter, uh, by using a four strip conductivity electrode that we got from um, ALS in Japan. So a value of 554 plus or minus 77 Siemens per centimeter square was determined, and this is comparable with the highest conductivity value reported for pristine P dot uh, film prepared using perchlorate anions, and they got a value between 400 and 650 Siemens per centimeter squared made by conventional electropolymerization at a solid electrode surface in a citron nitrile. So this is a very, very promising result for in terms of conductivity. So in situ conductivity measurements were also carried out in PBS solution using an interdigitated electrode shown here, operated in a transistor-like configuration. So comparison of in situ conductivity measurements was made between the 2D pin film, tin film prepared by interfacial electrosynthesis shown here and doped with sulfate anions and a commercial P dot PSS film drop cast and annealed directly onto the interdigitated microelectrode array. So in situ conductance was recorded from a positive potential where the P dot is conducting R on, and it was uh, then scanned to a negative potential. Both P dot films displayed the typical sigmoidal shape response expected for conducting polymer films. And the P dot tin film here had a maximum conductivity of 5.35 Siemens per centimeter squared in the plateau region from about plus 0.8 to zero volts. Meanwhile, the P dot PSS film had a maximum conductivity of only 1.2 Siemens per centimeter squared in this plateau region. More, most interestingly, the conductance window in the 2D P dot film is very significantly plus 0.4 volts greater than that of the P dot PSS film in PBS buffer solution. Therefore, the extended potential window seen here with this 2D P dot film that we prepared by interfacial electrosynthesis could have major potential advantages in organic electrochemical transistor devices because, the devices, because these work at lower potentials to avoid oxidative reactions or biological stress if the active layer is to be functionalized with cells. So here we have a video. So in this video, what we are looking at is the blue aqueous side of the 2D P dot film appears a metallic golden color when exposed to white light from an LED lamp as shown in the movie. 
So this interesting optical property is due in part to the nanoscale flatness of the liquid-liquid interface and the peanut tin film on that liquid-liquid interface. Um, a similar effect was reported with polyaniline films um, via a made ultra flat via a flash welding procedure. Now, such a golden reflection is due to fast and non localized electrons that give rise to plasmonic wave at the surface. And this indicates that the 2D peanut film we have prepared contains large amounts of highly delocalized electrons that are highly conductive. So on the very flat surface, the interaction between ambient light and these super fast electrons is observed like in gold. Um, meanwhile, on the rough side, the diffusion of light by nanometric variations in the morphology changes their optical properties. But the bluish color is an indication of an absorption in the red part of the spectrum, like the plasmons of gold nanoparticles. Now, a detailed investigation of these plasmons that we, we, we will carry out uh, using energy electron loss spectroscopy or EELS and using Raman spectroscopy. Now, the biocompatibility of our 2D PDOT film was compared with that of a PDOT PSS film in collaboration with Dr. Kieran McGorty's lab, and we found exceptional conductivity as shown by cell count per field of view using here confocal fluorescence for our 2D PDOT films with and without collagen. So our films with and without collagen are far more biocompatible than in with the commercial PDOT PSS films prepared by drop, drop casting and terminal annealing. So these uh, studies were performed using an adherent cell line of normal human retina pigment epithelium. And we have no, in effect, PSS in our films. And this was found to increase their biocompatibility massively. Now, to conclude, using PDOT as a model system, interfacial electrosynthesis has been demonstrated as a powerful new approach to produce 2D conducting polymer films with distinct molecular architectures and physiochemical properties. Immediate applications of these films will be in supercapacitor, organic electrochemical transistor, and tissue engineering technologies due to their biocompatibility. And these are all envisioned. Our future work will involve demonstrating interfacial electrosynthesis using other monomers of technologically important conducting polymers, such as polymer poly 3 hexyltiophene 25 diol so P3HD, that's used extensively in photovoltaic technology. Also, we want to upscale the production of 2D conducting polymer films by combining interfacial electrosynthesis with a roll-to-roll -roll continuous deposition method. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, my team. So these are all members of my team who work on the Polymer project. I particularly like to thank Alonso, Rob and Natalie who've been working on this for many years at this point. And both Rob and Natalie will, will discuss their work on Polymers later on today. And I would also like to thank my funders for the funding. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.